about Harold's book with my LinkedIn profile. Hi, I'm Josh Wolf, and these days I work as a developer advocate at Comundo, which is a German software company, and we do business process management workflow engines. So I'm just going to do a plug actually for the ultimate keyboard layout. So I switched from QWERTY. Does anybody here use Dvorak? Right on. So I did Dvorak for a year. And then I went to Colmac, so I'm using Colmac right now. Has anyone heard of Colmac? So I think 2009, something like that. So Dvorak was developed in the 1800s <laughs> as an alternative to QWERTY, but it doesn't really work for programming because people didn't do like braces and stuff back then. You do a lot of that if you're coding in JavaScript, right? So I'm like, let me try Colmac. And Matt Mullenweg, who runs Automatic, who make WordPress, he actually financially incentivizes developers there to switch to Colmac. So I was like, dude, this guy's putting his money where his mouth is. So I went to Colmac, it's pretty good, but this I discovered on Hack News just the other day. This is called Hellmac. <laughs> this one was developed over nine months by a Russian guy in Sydney using a genetic algorithm and an AI. It is the best keyboard layout possible. And um, so I switched over to it, and the cool thing about it is there's no sideways movement into those middle areas for letters. That's where the punctuation stuff is. Anyway, that's Hellmac. Just getting rid of the microphone. Just like this. Okay, how about, how's that? Is that better? Improved. We're getting notes. You guys got it? Okay, cool. Yeah, Hellmac it's called. And um, you can find it on GitHub, Mad Rabbit Hellmac. That's the layout there. So what I'm talking about today is I'm not talking about Next.js which is a React kind of thing. I'm not talking about Nest, which is like a Google Home Automation thing. I'm talking about Nest.js. And you can tell that it's different from the other ones because Nest.js has cats. <laughs> <laughs> this one here is the official Nest.js SVG logo, and then the homepage has like a cat there and another cat there. The open source platform designed for the future build enterprise. So I found out about this because, um, let me tell you about how it actually works on GitHub. GitHub is a social coding network. If you dump your own projects on there, fully complete or otherwise, it's not going to work. Because people are not hiring you unless they're hiring a solo developer to just do stuff by yourself. They're going to hire people who work with other developers. If you want to get hired through GitHub, what you do is you find some high profile project in the space that you want to work and you start opening issues in there, you start fixing documentation bugs and you work your way up until you become like a solid committer and you get PRs in there. If you have committed to the React core libraries, you will get a job as a React developer in Brisbane. It's really that simple. So the way I found out about Nest is that I was working in a fintech company here in Brisbane and I wrote an open source library for ZB, which is a project that Komunda have. And I I got the company to open source it on the internet through GitHub and I said, look, in 12 months time, we're going to be in one of two places. Either someone else in the community will create the open source library and then we will have to rebase our entire code into that community sourced one, or otherwise we're going to be maintaining our own separate fork and doing all the development and testing on it. So what we should do is we should open source our one and make it become the community supported one. And so we did that. And then the company that makes ZB hired me from Germany. I'm like the first Australian employee here, and I work for them. So I did that through coding on GitHub. And then I was looking at the dependencies of the package on NPM. It's got about 2,500 weekly downloads. But every now and then I go through GitHub to look at, if you've got a package in NPM, on GitHub you can see which other projects on GitHub use your package. So I always watch that. And I also watch other NPM packages that consume it. And I found this one here. It's called PayK Nest JS ZB. And so this guy had consumed my package and put it into this uh, Nest JS transport. Now, what Nest JS is is it's a back-end framework for Node.js for building servers. So REST servers, gRPC servers, GraphQL servers, WebSocket servers, and then you can extend it so you can build a ZB uh, server with it. And it's been influenced by the ideas of Angular. So with Angular, you have this idea of like um, convention over configuration. You have things like dependency injection. You have um, decorators, and you have TypeScript. 
And so front-end developers have had the ability to take advantage of these kind of things for a while, but there hasn't been anything like that on the back end. So on the back end, one of the things, I used to work with Harold as a recruiter, I did that for three years, and when Go became really big, and when I talked to people when I was placing Node developers who had switched from like .NET or Java, one of the things they said to me was that I really love programming in Go or in JavaScript because it's so lightweight and I don't need to like create a massive uh, framework or you know a dependency injection container just to create an HTTP server. So you know in, in Node what you can do is, uh, let me get up a, should do is Gremlins Tracker is a good uh, extension for Visual Studio Code. It detects zero width spaces in uh, code. Uh, I'll just make a temp directory here. Temp1, cd into that. And beat them. Yeah, coming up. There we go. And then I'm going to open VS Code. And then a new terminal in here. So it's pretty simple to create a uh, index.ts. Uh, all you need to do is like const HTTP equals require HTTP. And then here, well, I'm going to do it in TypeScript so I can get IntelliSense. This is one of the reasons why TypeScript is so cool, um, star as HTTP from HTTP is because it gives you typings and then I'll just npm init here uh, minus y otsc init and then install the node typings uh, at types node is that big enough? bigger? okay good Okay, so um, this is why TypeScript is so cool because I don't need to look up any documentation. Like, I literally have no idea what I'm doing. I just learn a few commands, I know how to scaffold the npm package, get the TSC thing to run, and after that, I'm just like, dude, I, I don't want to remember this stuff. Uh, HTTP create server, okay? And then what? Request listener, so I guess it takes a request and a response, and then it returns something. And then I think, do I have to give it a port? Uh, nope. Oh yeah, I can call listen. And then I give it a port. Okay, so I just created an HTTP web server using JavaScript in Node. And that's just like super simple. It, that's literally a single line of code. I mean, I've broken it across multiple lines, but you can, um, let's just do this someone called me. See, it's a single line of code to start an HTTP server. So if I now run that thing, and if I go here, I should be able to go to localhost 3000. And you can see here it says someone called me down there. So I just created an HTTP server in a single line of code in JavaScript. So developers are like, oh, this is just such a breath of fresh air. I didn't need to do like a massive Java Beans thing or like a you know, .NET framework, all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of freedom in it. There's a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of like doing it any way that you want to do it. And then the other thing about it is that once you start to actually build something with this, after a while, you find yourself reinventing the wheel over and over again because you end up with like a whole bunch of different kind of routes. How are you going to structure your project? What happens when you want to have some routes that are authenticated and some routes that are unauthenticated? And then what you end up doing is you end up like rewriting your own framework from scratch. So JavaScript is great because it scales from like the extremely simple like open, open developer tools in your um, web browser. <coughs> Uh, more tools, developer tools, I just open it up, no IDE, nothing, and I can just do console.log in here literally, and it will uh, log something. And I didn't have to install anything, nothing, like it just scales down to like the, like the barest minimum thing, you've got a web browser on your machine, you can do that. 
But the thing is that once you start to create things that are more complex than that, now you run into like how do you structure them. Then what happens is, let's say you end up in a company, a startup, you start like this, you build something, you build it over time, and then you leave the company and you go to work somewhere else, you join another company, they've done it a completely different way. Now you've got this massive learning curve. The other thing is that all the knowledge that you build up while you're in that company about how they've structured their project doesn't transfer anywhere else in the industry. And uh, Nest.js is like a super opinionated framework for creating these things so that you don't have to think about any of the things that you don't want to think about because creating a web server, how you structure your routes, none of that stuff provides any value to your users. Unless your business is making a framework, you're probably doing something else, right? Like if you're asking all your businesses, like connecting a two-sided marketplace where you connect people who want answers with people who can answer questions. And that's where you actually make money and provide value to people, not by figuring out how you're gonna structure your web server. You just wanna be able to start a web server, create everything, and you wanna be able to bring developers into the company and have them up to speed really fast. And if you're a developer working in that company, if you're, this is to your question about, if, if you stay there for three years, you know, you gotta look at the knowledge that you're gaining while you're in the company, because if, if the knowledge is only worth money to that company, then yeah, at a certain point, it does becomes non-transferable. So you're not gaining any more value for yourself in the marketplace. So the way Nest.js works is it uses uh, TypeScript decorators and it uses a runtime dependency injection system. So I'll go to the documentation. I don't even know how to. Um, I've written a couple of Nest.js um, systems that are in production, but I don't even bother remembering how to do it. I just like, it's got great documentation. I just literally cut and paste from the doc every time. So you install the Nest.js CLI, and then you run um, Nest new, I don't know, um, Nest new, Nest app, Nest generate, Nest new um, demo, call it demo. So it's gonna create a new demo project. Uh, we use NPM. Doing its installation thing. Has anybody here, how many people here have worked with decorators? Okay, a few. How many people here work with TypeScript? <laughs> Pretty much the same people, a few of us. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, decorators are, uh, they're, are they, they're in the, the, the latest ES spec, right? Are they out now? Are they officially, have they landed? Anybody knows? In JavaScript? Yeah, they're like stage four or something. Um, okay, it's created it. Here's my demo thing. So it comes fully scaffolded. It's got like all of your like testing and everything. So if I go into my source directory, I've got an app module. And so a Nest application has like a global namespace. And then each of your routes are their own modules and you can export things out of those uh, routes into the global namespace if you want to reuse them in other parts. So I'm going to create a new route in here. So I'll create a new route called um, test. No, it's already a folder in there called test. Somebody give me a name. Cats. 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 <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll work uh, Briz, BrizJS into there somehow. So actually it's nest generate route cats. Make sure that routes actually Nest generate. Schematic. Nest G double minus help. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, route. No, no route. Controller. Controller. Controller, uh, cats. Okay, so it's created a cats. Um, on the right, no, not on the right. That's why. Let me come out again. I forgot to cd down into the subdirectory. Let's <laughs> generate controller cats. So it's created here my cats controller. There's the spec for the tests, and here's the actual controller itself. So 
here you can see that all it has is it's got a class and then it has this annotation on it which is add control loop and it's got this um, parameter cat. So the way decorators work and the way they use the nest is something called aspect oriented programming. And what aspect oriented programming is that there are cross cutting concerns in your application that are not like the domain of any of the specific implementation details. And one of those is like, I want a REST endpoint that can service a GET, for example. And so you don't want to have to be rewriting that logic every time. So if you were doing this yourself from scratch, you would probably do the first few by hand manually. Then you'd look at them and go, you know what, these things are doing the same thing, and you dry it out into a library, and then like import it at the top, and then maybe wrap your route handler with it. That's the general pattern that you follow. So the way that's done in uh, Nest is with decorators. So this creates a controller called cats, and this is the cats controller. And then you just have to do a method on here like get, and if I say get um, the, the, the base route, and then I just um, hat. And then here I'm just gonna return, this is where we work in the Briz.js. Turn Briz.js, save that, and then down here I just go npm run start, and I run the dev profile. <coughs> it says it started. Um, I think it's running on localhost 3000. Let's find out. So if I go localhost 3000, yep, it's running there, and I go to cats, and then it's going to call the get, and you can see that it return brizjs just like that you can make these asynchronous so i can make make it return some kind of promise like if you're going to load some data from a database or something um, promise dot resolve and it does the same thing uh, so it integrates really well with type ORM, which is like a strongly typed object relational mapper for databases, which works really well. And what you can do with it is you can create, um, did anyone mention Swagger tonight? No. JSON, you can create JSON APIs very easily. And then you can create an auth service, and if you wanted to make this authenticated, Yeah, it integrates really well with Passport. It uses Express under the hood, and you can also use Fastify. So there are, there's a massive ecosystem of middlewares out there that you can use in Nest, and they've all got like uh, integrations for it. So you can use this auth guard, and then here I've got use guards, auth guard, and it uses the JSON web token auth guard. So all I needed to do here was create this route. It's a get, it uses the auth guard with JWT, and then in here I've annotated this parameter with request. So I get the request inside the function. And then in here, the JSON web token, so the way JSON web token works is, real simple example, use auth0, get their SDK, you integrate it into your front end app, and then people can log in with GitHub, Google, Facebook, anything like that, you don't need to write any code. And it'll go to Auth0, come back to your application, and it will pass in a JSON web token, which is like an encrypted um, string. And then you have the secret in your, in your server, so somewhere in my constants I've got my secret. And it will decode the JSON web token, and then what shows up in here is all of the data from their uh, you know, GitHub profile that they've shared with you. So this route here literally protects this um, user endpoint, and then when someone asks for it with a, an Auth0 JSON web token, I get their user profile from it, and I can get their email off that, and then I can ask the uh, database for that user, and that's all the code that I needed to write. Because it's 2019, and why would I write JSON web token, authorization, database access, it's like, Nobody makes any money out of writing that unless you know that's what you're doing and you're writing a framework. 
Otherwise, if your business is something else, like um, you know, getting people who ask questions together with people who answer questions, that's what you want to be focused on, rather than writing this, this additional stuff. So you can do all the normal stuff that you that you're probably familiar with REST routes. So you can have like parameterized routes, and you can get them with this param decorator in here. Um, what else can I tell you about NestJS? Um, the interesting thing for me about this package that this guy wrote was that what I work on in my day job as a developer advocate and, and as an open source software maintainer is a microservices orchestration engine. And it uses BPMN, if you know of that business process modeling and notation, to orchestrate microservices. And this guy just wrote a decorator that you just whack onto a route and suddenly your application can communicate with this other server. So this is the kind of thing that gets you like high velocity to market. Um, it's like a, a reusable skill set that you can take to another job when you work somewhere else. If you can convince the place where you're working at to use it on a project or you can learn how to use it, or this is the way that I would personally do it, you just get involved in the NestJS community in open source right now, become a contributor and committed to it, and this is the thing that most people looking for a job are really missing out on, is the thing is that the way the market works is that there are people looking for developers and they cannot find them. Now there will be people out there who are looking for NestJS developers, as an example, because I'm talking about NestJS, but you know, you take your pick, you, Ember, React, anything. They're looking for a React developer or a NestJS developer, and if you're the guy who is the one contributing to NestJS and you walk in there and sit down and they go, well, what have you been doing? You go, I've got these half-finished projects or fully completed projects on GitHub. Okay, great. But if you're the guy who sits down and goes, hey, Brisbane's number one contributor to NestJS, this guy, boom, you got the job. Unless you're a complete dick. <laughs> <laughs> you might not get it. Or you might get it and they might fire you. <laughs> then you can go work for NestJS in Poland. <laughs> Story of my life. Um, what else is there that I can show you about this thing? Anyone got any questions about it so far? So you mentioned um, open spec, and the thing I was thinking was, why would I just, why would I just write an open spec and get the code you made just from the um, Express server? Right? So what would be the advantage of using something like this versus writing that? Yeah, you can do that too. <laughs> In fact, you can do anything you want. You know TJ Holloway, Chuck, um, Harold mentioned him before. I had this guy come in, he was like, I want to be a JavaScript developer. And I was like, oh, okay, um, cool. So I can't remember what he was doing. He was doing something else, not JavaScript developing. I was like, okay, man, who are your favorite JavaScript developers, man? And he was like, um, I was like, dude. Imagine if you came in here and said to me like, yeah man, I want to be a house DJ. And I'm like, cool man, like who are your favorite house artists? And he's like, you don't know any. I'm like, come on, you're kidding yourself. You, you would have to have like, you know, if you wanted to be a metal guitarist, you gotta have like Metallica posters on your wall and stuff. But TJ Holloway Chuck, if you're in JavaScript land, he writes 60% of the Node ecosystem in the beginning. And people on, on Core, I think it is, they say, how is TJ Holloway Chuck so insanely productive? And there's a great thread on there, which is like, is TJ Holloway Chuck more than one person? <laughs> and they like your forensic analysis of his code and like his coding style. And then they also correlate it with his physical itinerary to see whether there are commits when he's like sleeping or you know where the commits have come from. And he came to Cam at GIS, you could have just asked him. <laughs> yeah, I know, when did he come? I was uh, one of the Melbourne Camp JS's probably three, four years ago, three years ago. Yeah, yeah. just missed him. Yeah. Yeah, he switched, he, he did goodbye JavaScript, I'm going to go, yep. and became a Go programmer. And that's another thread in there is like, why was TJ Holloway Chuck so insanely productive with JavaScript that hasn't made a dent in the Go ecosystem? <laughs> but he answered the question himself on Quora. And he said, like, when I got involved in, uh, in, in, in Node, it was so early that there were no frameworks and things around. So he wrote, he wrote Express. Um, he wrote Chalk. He wrote a whole ton of stuff like that. So the opportunity is always there because the technology is always expanding. And you heard it here first, NestJS is the next big thing. <laughs> Get on this thing. And you can also use code gen tools and write it in any language you want. Yeah.
Any other questions? Matthew. Does Nest.js lift, and if you were to des design a training regime for Nest.js to lift, what would you design? Deadlines. That's it. Expand or like what common things that you'd want to be able to do with a, a backend framework? Mm -hmm. Oh, the uh, is it is Nest like fully built out, and where do you see things need to be built out? Um, okay, so it does everything that I needed to do for REST endpoints for a REST application. In 2019, for a REST application, you want to do database access, you want to do authenticated and unauthenticated routes, authorization, identification, all that kind of stuff. It does all of that. Um, the place where I've run into a, a, an edge which is unresolved right now, this is like a real edge case, is a gRPC server that returns a gRPC error 8 resource exhausted error. It's, it can't be done in Nest right now. But there is an open pull request for it and they're working on it. But otherwise for REST kind of stuff, it covers pretty much everything. Also does GraphQL. Um, those are the main ones these days, right? REST, GraphQL, and then gRPC is like a kind of a distant third. So the, the whole Angular for um, for the back end from the back end um, that that statement is clearly loaded. Uh, do they mean uh, it's uh, MVC and the dependency injection is a specific kind of callback to Angular, or is, where does that come from? Yeah, it's that, and it's just also that here's a like a highly opinionated framework that you can use to build on on the back end, like. If you're an Angular developer, you know, if you're a JavaScript developer, you're a JavaScript developer, but people are like, we need an Angular developer. So that was one of the things for those developers who were escaping that world and coming to JavaScript. It was like, oh my God, no, the freedom. I can't believe it. I can do anything I want now. I don't have to learn this. Like, you know, I can actually program in the language rather than having to program in a framework. And I really appreciate that myself personally. But then sometimes I just want to get shit done. And I'm like, can somebody just like already solve this problem and I just like npm install it please? And like, uh, yeah, this is like your whole application structure, architecture, all the plumbing and everything that you need, plus some um, strong typing. And so Camille, the guy who uh, started Nest.js, that was his point. He said like, front end developers have had this kind of situation that they can opt into with Angular for many years now. Now it's time that we got it on the back end for Node. So that was kind of his thing about it, was like Angular for the back end. And also, I, I interviewed the guy, I'll, I'll tweet it out, so I interviewed the guy who wrote that Nest.js transport, and on GitHub it says he's in Melbourne. And I was like, hey man, you're in Melbourne? He's like, no dude, I'm in Tel Aviv. <laughs> and so they're an Australian-Israeli startup, and uh, he said he's the only one, in, he's the CTO, he said he's the only one in management who's never been to Australia. But I interviewed him over the internet. Uh, I released the podcast today. And I had a point that I was going to make with that, and I completely forgot it. But I'll tweet out to check it out. Um, um, do you have any like anti use case for um, when you wouldn't use it? Where you, where yeah, hundred percent. Like if you want to stick it to the man, and you're like, dude, I'm going to do what I want. No one tells me what to do. I love to code. <laughs> <laughs> I like writing heaps of code and doing it my way. And then, if you can write as much code as this guy wrote to, to build this thing in the first iteration, you could probably become the next framework author. <laughs> but if you actually have something that you wanted to get done that wasn't writing the framework to do it, then I would just use it. Oh, um, so look, you know, where I was working before, the team I was on basically ended up implementing pretty much what Nest.js does internally. And Part of what we went through in doing that was like, there's so many frameworks out there, how are we gonna like evaluate all of them? And this is another thing about GitHub, like when you understand how it actually works, it's a social network. Like now, I do hardly any, I do heaps of coding actually, but I don't do anywhere near what I did before because I now have a network of people where I can go, now what's the framework that I should use? So when I interviewed um, Dan about it, I was like, yeah, I gotta do some front end stuff. And he was like, yeah, we're using Ember on the front end and Nest on the back end. That's what we did. And he said, we did a month and a half of proof of concepts before we landed on that. And I was like, great, I'll do that. So I became like Brisbane's number two Ember programmer after Kati. <laughs> <laughs> the two of us. <laughs> Is anybody else here using Ember? Okay, maybe I'm number three. <laughs>
but it's that it's that network effect right like when we were, when Harold and I were at uh, JDP together, we uh, we went on GitHub and we started analyzing people's profiles. So we would analyze who they followed, who what they commented on. So as a recruiter, if I'm analyzing your GitHub profile, I don't care about the code that you committed. What I care about is what people said about the code that you committed. So if nobody has commented on anything in your repo, it's worthless. But if you've made a pull request to React, and then Dan Abramov jumps in there and goes, oh, that's great, thanks for doing that. <laughs> that's a win. And then so we analyzed the profiles and we looked for like who are the biggest, most followed people on GitHub. And uh, we got to the top three. The, there's a guy, um, I can't remember who those t top three were. I think TJ Holwechuk might have been number three or four. Then there was another guy from PaySquare or something, Squarespace, he was number two. And he was like following 54 people. And then the guy who was at number one, he was like, he had like so many million people following him and he was following no one. <laughs> <laughs> That's Linus Torvalds. So if you want to write like heaps of code, you can become that guy. But otherwise, the best thing that you can do is integrate yourself into an existing network on GitHub and have those people comment on your code and be commenting on their stuff and then they comment on your comments. That's what will raise you up. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much.